So let's begin today's discussion by considering a problem. And the problem goes something like this. Imagine that you were a lifeguard at a beach and that you spot a potential drowning victim in the water. Uh, that's me, the drowning victim, your physics professor. And your goal, of course, is to save me. So considering that you can run on the beach faster than you can swim, okay, what path should you take to reach the victim, me, in the least amount of time? Well, you see me, now you see you. There you are. Now, certainly the straight line path represented by this blue arrow would represent the path of least distance. But that may not be the path of least time, considering the fact that you can run on the sand faster than you can swim in the water. Well, if we consider this path, this path here is certainly not the path of least distance, but this would allow you to spend the least amount of time in the water. But which path should you actually take to reach me in the least amount of time? Well, that path, of course, will depend upon how much faster you can run on the sand than you can swim in the water. Okay, so like we're saying here, the straight line path representing the path of least distance would not be the path of least time. Okay, you would be able to arrive at your victim faster when you spend more time on the sand, okay, where you can actually travel faster. So the amount of bending at the shoreline really depends, of course, on how much faster you can run than you can swim. So the actual path of least time is probably going to represent a, a balance between the green path I'm showing you here and the blue path. And of course, the actual path is going to depend upon okay, your speed in the sand as well as your speed in the water. Now, if you're asking yourself, what does this have anything to do with light? Well, consider what we know about Fermat's principle of least time. Okay, light behaves very much in the same way as a lifeguard does. Light will take the path of least time, not necessarily the path of least distance. So we'll begin our discussion of fraction today from a qualitative point of view, and then as our discussion progresses, we'll become a little more quantitative in our description of refraction. So before we actually define what refraction is, let's review a little bit about wave theory. And this is nothing new. This is something we said last time as well. Okay, the rules for the reflection and transmission of waves at boundaries. So when a wave is traveling in one medium and it enters a new medium, we can say that at the boundary between the media, some of that wave's energy will get reflected into the uh, initial medium. Some of the wave's energy will get transmitted into the new medium. What determines how much of that wave's energy gets reflected versus transmitted at the boundary? That depends upon the difference in the wave speed okay, at that boundary, the difference in wave speed between the two media. And remember, we said that the wave speed okay, depends upon uh, these two factors, the elasticity of the medium, right? The speed of the wave is directly proportional to this elastic factor and is inversely proportional to this inertial factor, which is typically measured by the density of the media. So um, last time we looked at, okay, and you see here in the, the simulation that when the wave comes in, we see that and it encounters the boundary, we see that some of, uh, some of that energy gets reflected here. So we have a reflected wave. That's what we talked about last time. Okay. But this time we're going to now focus upon what happens to the transmitted wave. Okay. So last lesson we looked at the reflected wave. In today's lesson we'll be focusing exclusively on that transmitted wave. And let's now define this concept of refraction. Refraction can be thought of as, okay, this phenomenon where the wave direction changes, okay, as the wave enters a new medium, at some angle with respect to the normal. So all I'm saying here is that if the wave was to enter the medium right along the normal line, for that one special case where you have uh, an incident angle of zero degrees, 
then you would have no refraction. You would get no bending of the light when it enters a new medium. For all other angles, you will find, as you see in this simulation here, that that light ray is going to bend as it enters a new medium. So how would we actually explain the cause of refraction? What causes a light ray to bend when it enters a new medium at some angle with respect to the normal, okay, to the interface? Well, we can explain the cause from a macroscopic point of view very simply. We simply say it's due to the fact that the waves change speed as they go from one medium into another. So it's the change of wave speed that causes this bending, that causes refraction. Now, from a microscopic point of view, how could we explain why waves would change speed as they go from one medium into another? Well, for transparent media, for media which actually will transmit electromagnetic radiation, okay, we can say that as the light travels through the media, that the energy has to be absorbed and subsequently re-emitted by the atoms in that media. In this absorption and subsequent re-emission of the energy, it takes time. It causes a delay. And it's this delay that will affect how fast uh, light can travel in that medium. The greater the time between absorption and re-emission, the slower the speed of the light. So in order to uh, try to understand refraction and try to make predictions about which way a light ray is going to bend when it enters the new medium, I kind of like this analogy. And of course, analogies all have limitations, but um, I think this is helpful when it comes to being able to predict which way the light ray is going to bend when it enters the new medium. So the analogy goes something like this. Consider the front axle of your car as it travels from one medium into another. And I, I will choose concrete and mud because I think we all have enough experience driving to know that your wheels, the wheels of your car will travel much faster on concrete than they will in mud. So let's take a look. Here's a section of concrete. Here's a section of mud. And let's take a look at the front axle of your car, which I'm showing you right here. Now, you'll notice here, what I'm showing you is a position of this front axle at uh, equal intervals of time. Let's say at one second time intervals. And you'll notice that while your wheels are entirely on one medium, okay, then the left wheel will travel exactly the same distance as the right wheel which would mean then that the front axle is going to travel in a straight line. But let's take a look at what happens right when we get to the boundary between the new media. Notice here that your right wheel, okay, is now going to enter a portion of mud where it's going to travel slower, whereas your left wheel still has some concrete to travel on. So you can imagine that the left wheel right here is going to travel a greater distance in this next one second time interval because it's traveling on concrete than will your right wheel here which is now going to be traveling in mud where it travels slower. So this is going to cause the front axle of your car to bend here. Okay now once your uh, both wheels are entirely in the muddy region okay now both wheels can travel at the same distance in the same time, in which case from the point where your wheels are entirely in the mud, okay, now your car, now your front axle is gonna travel in a straight line. So the bending really happens here exclusively right at the boundary. And while this is an analogy, you can see that it nicely predicts which way not only your front axle, but your light, the light is going to bend. If we replace the front axle here with light waves, we will see that when your the light is traveling from a medium where it can travel fast and enters a medium where it gets slowed down, this tells you that the light wave, the ray, is going to bend towards the normal to the interface. And we'll explain this 
okay, or restate it on, on the next slide. So in this slide, we will state the rules of bending. In other words, okay, state the rule that determines which way light is going to bend as it enters the new medium. And to give us a little help here, we recruit our friendly one-year rabbit, Bongo, and we'll always, always take advice from a one-year rabbit when he says, learn the rules of bending, but don't bend the rules. So very good advice, Bongo. Let's see what you mean by that. Uh, here I am going. I'm showing you two different slabs here, okay, and um, the the normal to the interface between those two slabs. So we're assuming that light will travel faster in one media than it will in the other. So when light, okay, when a light wave enters a material where it speeds up, the rule says that it gets bent away from the normal. And um, if I show you an incident ray here traveling in this medium, perhaps because this is a less, uh, sorry, a more optically dense medium, and this purple ray gets refracted when it gets bent at the boundary between the new media. So it's entering a medium where um, it, the optical density is probably lower and it can actually speed up. When that light wave speeds up, it gets bent away from the normal. Okay, conversely, when you have a light wave which enters a medium where it slows down, so if we have a light ray doing going exactly in the opposite from okay, uh, this medium here represented in the red ray, okay, into the medium where it slows down, in that case it would make sense that the ray would get bent towards the normal. So um, let's actually, rather than just look at this through a simulation, if CN is believing in the next slide, okay, we'll take a look at this in real time where you'll actually see the real refraction of light, okay, traveling through a transparent media. All right, so folks, let's take a look at some refraction of light in real time. As you'll see in this setup, we have a laser which is shining a beam of light through air when that beam actually hits a piece of plastic right here. Perspex. And you'll see that when the light enters the new medium, when it enters the plastic, you'll see how it gets bent towards the normal. Um, when we look at the incoming light here, we see that there's an incident angle with respect to the normal, which with our protractor back there, uh, we can make a reading for, and it turns out it's about 60 degrees. But because of the refraction of light, when we actually measure that angle of refraction right here, we see that the angle of refraction is only about half of that, about 30 degrees. So clearly we see that when light enters a medium where it slows down, that is when it goes from a less optically dense medium into a more optically dense medium, the light ray gets bent towards the normal. In the next several slides, we will take a look at some of the effects of refraction. So just to point out, many optical illusions, okay, a lot of magic has to do with the refraction of light, the fact that light rays bend and can fool the mind, as we'll see in this next demonstration of what I call the disappearing coin trick. All right, folks, this magic shit. <laughs> All right, folks, this magic trick I'm about to show you makes use of the refraction of light. What you're looking at here, you can see this 
uh, styrofoam cup, but you can't see the coin right now. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tip it towards you so you can see there's a coin down there in the bottom of the cup. But when I put the cup in this position, that coin is just slightly outside of your view. But notice what happens when I slowly add water to the cup. Okay, as I slowly add water into this cup, you should see that coin start to come into your view. Okay, and as we will explain, this is all due to the fact that light is getting refracted or bent at the surface of the water. So in this slide, let's see if we can explain the physics behind the disappearing coin trick. Um, so what we have here is we have our cup with a coin, and in this case, the cup is full of air. And we said that the position of your eye in relation to the cup and coin is such that you can uh, the coin is barely out of your view. So if I look at uh, this light ray, the one that barely misses the edge of the cup here, you can see that that light ray does not enter your eye, um, showing you that this little part of the coin here uh, is not in your view. What we have here is we have the cup with water in it. And you'll notice here that even for a ray which enters at a smaller um, incident angle than the one I'm showing you in the picture on the left, even for this ray, because of the refraction at the boundary, okay, at the air-water boundary, and because light is traveling from a more optically dense medium, that is water, into a less optically dense medium, that is air, it is going to bend away from the normal. So here we see that light can now enter your eye because of its bending. So you'll see that for this ray and many others like it, the uh, refraction will cause the coin to actually be in your view. So in the next, in my next magic trick, this is what I call thumb on steroids, okay, where you will see the special solution here, I call a digit enlargement solution, is going to make my thumb grow inside of a beaker. All right, everyone, this refraction demo is what I like to call thumb on steroids, okay? And let me tell you what I'm going to do before we do it, but you're going to take a look at uh, my thumb inside of this beaker, okay, this beaker full of air, and you're going to see an image of my thumb because light is going to get reflected off my thumb and into your eye. Then I'm going to take some of this special solution here. This is called digit enlargement solution, okay, and it's going to replace the air that's in the beaker and you're going to see what happens to my thumb. So let's start by taking a look at my thumb in air. Okay, I think everybody can see an image of it. Okay, let's now take some of the special digit enlargement solution. Okay, pour it in here. Okay, and let's see what happens when I stick my thumb in. Okay, oh my gosh. Okay, can you see that? Looks like my thumb grew in size. Okay, what am I going to do to get it out of this beaker? Now, I know what you're all thinking right now. Okay, you're thinking that I should give up my day job and become a professional magician. I know, and I'm considering it, but don't worry, not before the end of this course. So let's see if we can uh, explain what is going on with my magically enlarging thumb. So um, I'm showing you here a picture of the test tube, and uh, <clears throat> there's my thumb. Uh, true, I did it in the beaker in the demo, but it works equally well for test tubes, believe it or not. So let's take a look at a few of the light rays and, and trace them. So you'll notice here, here is uh, one of the light rays that is leaving my thumb that is traveling through the water and then the glass. And when it gets to the boundary where it enters the air, that w light wave would speed up and therefore would bend away from the normal. 
okay, as it enters a new medium. Here's another light ray on the other side, okay, it comes up and once again will bend away from the normal as it speeds up in the new medium, which is air. Now here's the thing about the human brain. Uh, the human brain is not as smart as you might imagine, okay, it cannot detect the true path of light. Your brain has evolved to think that light only travels in straight lines. So it cannot follow the bending path of the light rays. And what your mind does in trying to form an image and figure out where that point on my thumb is, is it looks for a point of convergence of the light rays that enter it. So in other words, okay, when we look at this light ray here, let me get a laser pointer. <clears throat> this light ray here, um, it's going to look for a point of convergence between this light ray and this light ray. And because your brain thinks that light travels in straight lines, okay, it will find a point of convergence here at this point of intersection of these two rays. Um, so your brain thinks that this point on your thumb down here is really much further up, okay, and much closer to the surface of the beaker or test tube. So it appears that your thumb has grown. Um, so for the la my last magic trick, I'm not going to tell you, you know, a good magician never reveals his secrets here. So this one you got to figure out on your own and see if you can figure out what's going on. Okay, using what you know about refraction in this figure here. So we've got a glass full of air, okay, a glass full of water, and see if you can figure out why those arrows seem to <clears throat> reverse in direction. So let's take a look at a fun problem. Okay, one that actually could save your life someday if you were in the wilderness and needed to catch fish in order to survive. So the problem goes something like this. If you were to catch a fish with a spear, okay, should you aim directly at the fish, above the fish, or below the fish? Well, as you can see in our picture over here, the uh, fish is in the water, and because of the refraction of light, Okay, you see that the ray of light leaving the fish, when it gets to the boundary between the water and the air, we know that it is going to get bent away from the normal. All right, and you remember in the last slide we said, well, that may be the true path that the light takes, but your eye or your brain is not smart enough to interpret that true path because your brain interprets light as always traveling in straight lines. So your brain is going to interpret the fish to be a little bit further up okay, in the water than it actually is. So in this case, you see here that you should actually aim a little bit below where you observe the fish to be. <clears throat> Changing up the problem a little bit, what would happen if you were to go fishing with a laser gun? <clears throat> should you aim above the fish, below the fish, or directly at the fish? Well, hopefully you realize here that a laser gun, okay, which consists of a certain frequency of light, okay, that the light from the gun is going to behave exactly the same way as the ray of light which is leaving the fish and entering your eye. So in that case, you would be fortunate enough to be able to aim your gun directly at where you see the fish since the light from the laser gun will refract exactly the same way as the light that leaves the fish and enters your eye. So in order to discuss refraction in a quantitative sort of way where we can predict okay, quantitatively how much light bends when it enters a new medium, okay, that is to be able to measure an angle of refraction in order to do that, we need to be able to talk about the speed of light in media. Remember that it's really a measure of how much the speed of light changes when it enters a new medium that determines how much that light is going to bend in the new medium. 
So rather than dealing with the speed of light itself, we introduce this other quality quantity called an index of refraction, which we symbolize by n. And light speeds tend to be really big numbers, so we use this concept of an index of refraction to measure light speed as well as optical density. So let's define it here. By definition, the index of refraction of a given medium is simply the speed of light in a vacuum, which we said um, from Michelson's experiment is about three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, divided by the speed of light in the medium. So you can see here that for media where light travels very slowly, the index of refraction will be bigger. There's an inverse relationship here. Um, for media where light travels very fast, where it travels close to the speed of light in a vacuum, okay, for those cases, the indices of refraction will be very close to one, okay, when the speed V approaches the speed C in a vacuum. So let me show you a chart here. Here are certain substances and their indices of refraction. So you can see here that um, certainly for air, light travels almost as fast in air as it does in a vacuum. So you see here that the index of refraction is very close to one. In fact, it's very often so close to one, we can just consider it to be one. Uh, you'll see here when light travels through water, Okay, it, gets, it travels slower, so its index of refraction is about 1.33. When it travels through glass, and there's different types of glass, the difference between crown glass and flint glass here. Um, and notice how big the indices, index of refraction is for a diamond here. It's very large. And that has a lot to do with a phenomenon we'll talk about later today, the dispersion that leads to the brilliance um, and the reason we pay a lot of money for diamonds. So uh, in this next slide, I'm going to put on my magician's hat again and show you uh, one last magic trick involving refraction, really the index of refraction, okay, and uh, light. All right, this refraction demonstration, I think you're really going to like, because you're going to see a little bit of magic right before your very eyes. What I have here is I have this uh, broken beaker that uh, I dropped before coming to class, and I'm going to drop it in this, this larger beaker here full of vegetable oil here. I'm going to drop it in, okay, and get it in there, these pieces, if I can do it without cutting myself. Okay, and this vegetable oil here. And if you want to now focus down here on the beaker, and let's see, we need to uh, do a little magic. How about uh, bippity boppity boo? Let's see what happens here, folks. Okay, notice that, okay, what I am going to do is I am going to pull out that beaker completely intact. Okay, amazing. Okay, no glue necessary, just a little bit of magic. So in this slide, let's see if we can explain the physics behind the disappearance of that beaker as well as the spontaneous Okay, reassembling of those pieces of broken beaker. So where, where is our beaker? Hey, not, not that beaker. Okay, uh, that's better. Okay, disappearing beaker. So in order to explain this, how did the beaker magically disappear upon entering the corn oil? Okay, well, it, it has to do with the fact that the index of refraction for corn oil and the borosilicate glass that the beaker is made out of are very, very similar, which, which means that most of the energy is going to get transmitted versus reflected the boundary between these two media. Okay, remember we said in one of the opening slides that what is it that determines how big the reflected wave is going to be at the boundary? In other words, how much energy is going to get reflected versus transmitted at the boundary? It's really a question of how different the media are. 
how much the speed of the wave changes upon entering the new media. When the media are very similar to each other, okay, very little energy gets reflected. Almost all of the energy gets transmitted at the boundary. And remember, okay, in order for you to see an object, like see that beaker, light traveling from the oil to the beaker must get reflected from it at the boundary there, okay, and then subsequently into your eye. But in this case, due to the fact that the indices of refraction are so similar that the light that travels from the oil to the beaker glass uh, changes speed very little, very little of the light at that boundary will get reflected into your eye, meaning that you are not going to see okay, that borosilicate beaker glass. Now, as to the physics behind uh, how that beaker glass spontaneously reassembles and forms a brand new beaker. Okay, well, the physics of that is, is inexplicable. Okay, we have to leave that one to the realm of pure magic. So we've said that when a wave travels from one medium into a new medium, that the wave speed changes. What else about the wave changes as it travels from one medium into another? Well, let's take a look. Um, we'll review some of the uh, things we know about wave properties. So if a wave traveling in one medium enters a new medium, let's take a look at these three properties, wave speed, wave frequency, and wavelength. Okay, and we'll ask the question, does the property change as the electromagnetic wave enters a new medium? Well, wave speed, we already talked about that, and the answer is yes. And we said that because when a wave uh, is traveling through a transparent media, that it gets slowed down because the energy has to get absorbed and subsequently re-emitted by the atoms in that media. And this process takes time. So we would expect that the wave speed should change and the time between the absorption of the energy and the remission of the energy okay, will have everything to do with how fast the wave can actually travel in that medium. So what about wave frequency? Well, the answer here is no. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a scenario here. Let's suppose that you are situated at the boundary or the, the interface between the two media, watching a wave come at you okay, as it enters the new medium. Uh, with nothing better to do, you sit there and you count the number of wave crests that pass you in a given period of time. So what you're really doing is you're measuring the frequency, right? The frequency of a wave is simply the number of wave crests, the number of complete waves that pass you per unit time. So if consider what, would, what you would conclude if the number of wave crests passing you per unit time were to change, okay, this would imply that waves were either being created or destroyed at the boundary. Okay, and since waves are a means of transporting energy, okay, then that would imply that energy would be created or destroyed at the boundary as well, in clear violation of the law of conservation of energy. So um, when a wave enters a new medium, the frequency of that wave does not change. Okay, that would clearly violate this fundamental law in, in our universe, the law of conservation of energy. So Let's think about the implications here. According to the wave equation, okay, if wave speed equals wavelength times frequency, then um, for a constant frequency, okay, if the wave speed were to change when the wave enters a new medium, then that would imply that the wavelength would also have to change. Okay, so our answer here would be yes. And like we're saying, so from the wave equation, V equals lambda F, Okay, if V changes, but the frequency does not change, if the frequency is a constant, okay, then the only possibility would be that the wavelength must change as well okay, in, in order for this wave equation to remain valid. So, bottom line, when a wave travels from one medium into another, 
Remember that the frequency does not change, but both the wave speed and the wavelength will change in a direct fashion. We can use the wave equation to tell us how the wavelength changes at the boundary in terms of the wave speed, but what we would like to do is derive an expression for the wavelength change at the boundary in terms of the indices of refraction of the two media, the incident and the refractive medium. So let's quickly do that. Let's derive this expression for the, the new wavelength, I'll say lambda prime, in the new medium. Okay, the refracted medium. So let's consider a wave traveling from medium one with speed V1 and frequency F1, okay, into medium two with speed V2 and frequency F2. So as we said, the frequency does not change, okay? The, the frequency of the wave in medium one must be identical to the frequency of the wave in medium two if the law of conservation of energy is to remain valid. From this, we can apply the wave equation to uh, express the fact that this ratio, wave speed to wavelength in medium one, must be exactly equal to that ratio of wave speed to wavelength in medium two. And using our definition of the index of refraction, all right, remember that uh, the index of refraction is the speed of light of the wave in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the me medium. So basically V, the speed of light in a medium is given by the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the index of refraction for the medium. So we'll just make that substitution for our incident and refracted media. And when we do that and we simplify here, we come up with this expression that N1 lambda 1 is equal to N2 lambda 2, or okay, written a little bit differently, we can say that lambda 2, that is the wavelength of the wave in the new medium, okay, the transmitted medium, is equal to this ratio of N1 over N2 times lambda 1. So Snell's law is that physical law that gives us a quantitative measure of refraction, telling us how much a wave will actually bend when it enters a new medium. So in this slide, we will actually just state Snell's law. In the next slide, we'll, we'll, we'll prove it or derive it so you can see where it comes from. So let's describe here um, how are we going to uh, describe the refraction of an electromagnetic wave. Well, some of these terms should be very familiar. So as always, we will define our refraction, just like we did for reflection, uh, as an angle made by uh, an incident and a refracted ray with respect to the normal to the interface, the normal to the boundary between the media. So uh, we have an incident medium, okay, defined by our incident ray. And as we know from last time, okay, some of that wave's energy will get reflected at the boundary between the media. So we talked about in our last uh, video lecture, and some of that wave's energy will get transmitted into the new medium. That's the refracted ray. And um, N1 will represent the index of refraction of the incident medium. Okay, N2, the index of refraction of the transmitted or let's say refracted medium. So no surprise here, the angle of incidence, we talked about that before, okay, the angle that the incident ray makes with respect to the normal, okay, the angle of reflection, this is just to review the angle that the reflected ray makes with respect to the normal, and now we can talk about an angle of refraction, okay, the angle that that transmitted ray, the refracted or bent ray, makes with respect to the normal to the interface. So Snell's law doesn't just apply to electromagnetic waves, it applies to all waves. And remember we said that the, the, the bending of a wave as it enters a new medium is due to the fact that the wave changes speed upon entering that new medium. So uh, this is applicable to all waves and here's a statement of Snell law that is true for all waves. Okay, whether we're talking about sound waves or light waves, that this ratio of the sine of 
Okay, uh, theta in one medium over the speed of the wave in one medium must be equal to the sine of the angle in our transmitted medium divided by the speed in the transmitted medium. So when we look specifically at electromagnetic waves, remember we said that rather than talking about wave speed, we like to use the index of refraction. So we can make that substitution, okay, and for wave speed in Snell's law. And when we do that, all right, we will end up with this relationship here that, um, okay, N1 sine theta 1. So if we say that's the incident medium, okay, the uh, index of refraction of the incident medium times the sine of the angle of incidence must be equal to N2, uh, the index of refraction of the refractor or transmitted medium times sine theta 2. That would be the angle of refraction. All right, uh, in this slide, we will actually derive Snell's law, okay? We don't want to just hand wave and state it. We want to show where it comes from. And just like we did for the law of reflection, the law of rectilinear reflection, we said that it can be uh, derived or justified using Fermat's principle of least time. So um, our derivation here is going to be virtually the same as what we saw for the law of reflection. Let's point out the differences here. Remember in the law of reflection, we said if we have a light ray which travels from point A, and for the law of reflection, we had point B over here where my laser uh, pointer is, where the, the cursor is, um, because point B was in the same medium. And we showed that the angle of incidence had to be equal to the angle of reflection when we minimize the amount of time of travel okay, between those two points. The only difference here is we now make point B in a different medium. Okay, um, If you look at the geometry that the two triangles we're going to look at are identical, the only difference is, is that now okay, when the wave enters this new medium, it travels at a different speed than it would in the incident medium. So that is virtually the only difference in our derivation here. So let's quickly go through it. We'll do it quickly this time. So let's consider a light ray starting at point A in medium one, okay, and ending at point B in medium two. And we're gonna, once again, start by finding the amount of time it takes for the light to travel this path, okay, to travel from A to the interface, to the boundary, and then, okay, travel to B in the new medium. And we've got theta one and theta two, right? Our incident angle and our refracted angle here. And the time of travel will, just like we did before, be equal to the distance divided by the speed. Okay, the way we get the distance here from A to the interface is just by using Pythagorean theorem. It's exactly the same expression we got when we applied this to, law of, to the law of reflection. So distance is just the hypotenuse of the side of the right triangle here. Okay, now the speed um, we will write in terms of the index of refraction, okay, is C over N1, N1 the refractive index of the incident medium, um, plus the amount of time it takes our light ray to travel from the interface to point B which is simply this distance right here, which is simply the hypotenuse of this right triangle here. Okay, so we take the square root of the sum of the squares of the legs of that right triangle and we get our numerator here. And our denominator here, the speed of the wave is now different, unlike in the case of reflection, because our wave is traveling in a different media. Once again, C divided by the refractive index of that media will tell us the wave speed there. So just as before, to find the actual path the light ray travels, we apply Fermat's principle of least time. Because remember that the path that light actually takes will be the path that minimizes the amount of time involved. So our, our variable here, x, which we couldn't express in terms of theta, but our variable x, we need to basically, um, you know, when we look at the relationship Okay, between uh, the time of travel and this variable x, we want to set that derivative, 
okay, of time with respect, e, with respect to x equal to 0, in which case we know that uh, when we solve that equation, okay, and, and find our value for x, that that will be the value corresponding to the minimum value of time, right? Because it would represent a, a maxima or a minima. So when we okay, take the derivative of this time expression with respect to the variable x and set it equal to zero, this is what we get here. I won't go through all of the, um, okay, the calculations. You can do that. It's very similar to what we did for the case of reflection. Set that equal to zero, and once again, you'll notice that the factor of a half and the factor of two cancel. We can multiply both sides by c and get rid of that. Once again, here, the factor okay, on, uh, okay, of one half and two will cancel here, and the negative one will disappear when we bring that to the other side. And <clears throat> brings us to this point here. And we see here that, uh, just like in the case for reflection, this ratio x over the square root of x squared plus a squared, okay, this triangle here, x over the hypotenuse, that ratio of those two sides of the triangle is nothing more than the sine of this angle theta 1. Okay, and likewise, when we take the ratio of l minus x to the square root of this mass over here, the ratio of those two sides of this leg over the hypotenuse, that is simply the sine of this angle here, theta 2. So this simplifies here to Snell's law. We'll finish up our discussion of Snell's law by taking a look at the sample problem, which has a rather interesting result here, and that is how do you uh, keep CD music noise free? Um, I think you guys remember what those are, what CDs are. Uh, so when we talk about a CD, it is a laser beam that is reading basically uh, pits and, and grooves that have been etched into a piece of plastic here, all right, on, on the information layer of the CD. And we're told in this problem the laser beam um, that reads the information from a compact disc is okay, 0.737 millimeters wide at the point where it strikes the underside of the disc and forms a converging cone with a half angle of 27 degrees. Um, as you see in the figure. So uh, it then travels through a 1.2 millimeter thick layer of transparent plastic with a refractive index of 1.55 before reaching the very thin reflective information layer near the disk top surface. So we're asked in this problem to find the beam diameter, little d, at the information layer. Okay, so how big is the beam here after it has been refracted through this piece of plastic? Um, so um, you can, I think you can see here from the geometry that we're, we're going to have to use Snell's Law at some point. And that really this problem is probably more a problem in geometry than it is one in physics. The physics is fairly simple, Snell's Law. But there's a little bit of geometry you're going to have to do, a little right triangle trigonometry to be able to arrive at your answer. So let's take a look here. So I'm going to show you here. This is the, uh, uh, okay, the laser beam that comes in. And when it hits this, travels from the air into the plastic, okay, you will see that the refraction causes the narrowing of the beam there. So this... This is quite important, as we'll see at the very end of this problem. Um, all right, so I'm going to get rid of that so we can see our numbers here. And you can see here from the figure that uh, the dimensions of the beam that we're asked to find here, little d, okay, on the information layer, uh, should be equal to, okay, the beam width where it enters the plastic uh, layer here, big D, minus 2 times x. 
All right, and X here, when we look at the geometry here, using a little bit of right triangle trigonometry, we can say that X is equal to uh, okay, T, the thickness of this piece of plastic, okay, times the tangent of okay, theta 2 here, really our uh, angle of refraction here. So you'll notice here that theta 1 defines our angle of incidence in the incident media, which is air, and theta 2, which I didn't really fit in here, is our angle of refraction, the angle that the refracted ray makes with respect to the normal. So uh, let's apply Snell's law here to figure out this value for the angle of refraction. Snell's law tells us that Okay, the index of refraction in our incident medium, which is air, times the sine of the angle of incidence, which we're told in the problem is 27 degrees, must equal the refractive index of the uh, transmitted medium, which is plastic, times the sine of the angle of refraction, which we are going to try to find. And when we plug in our numbers here, we find out that theta 2 is equal to the inverse sine of okay, this expression here, whose values are known. So we look up in the table, we can look up, air has an index of refraction, recall, of about 1.0003. We're told the index of refraction of plastic is 1.55. We do the number crunching, and this uh, will give us the value for theta here. Um, so we're going to combine our expressions here. Remember, we're trying to find a little d. So we've got d minus 2x, where x is equal to t tan theta 2. And we will plug in this value here, this expression, all in terms of known quantities for theta 2, for our angle of refraction. And at this point here, okay, we're going to plug in all the numbers and do the calculations, right? So everything is known. We can solve for a little d and we find out that it has a value of about 1.8 micrometers. So it's kind of interesting here to notice that uh, I'm showing you in the figure here the narrowing of this beam, but it is certainly not drawn to scale. All right, notice that at the information layer, that beam is very, very narrow, which it must be in order to read the information. Okay, these, these you know, um, pits that have been etched into this piece of plastic here, all right, um, are, are quite small. So that means that we need a very small laser beam to be able to read them. Now, um, you, you should note here that this thickness um, is a little bit larger than the pits that are cut into the CD that uh, the information is stored in. This narrowing of the beam plays a crucial role in keeping uh, CD music noise free. If you think about it, a, the tiniest speck of dust would blot out information at the micrometer scale okay, of the information layer. Imagine that if, if we didn't have the refraction happening, if we didn't have this piece of plastic here that the laser beam had to travel through, if all we had were the pits on this information layer here that had dimensions on the order of micrometers, well, a very, very small piece of dust, okay, would cause so much interference that it would, it would basically mess up the interpretation, the reading of, okay, that, that sound, okay, I'm sorry, of that, that wave here. Um, but by allowing a much thicker beam here, okay, at this side of the plastic here, you can see here, which is on the order of, you know, 0.737 millimeters, about a millimeter. You can see here that if there is a micrometer piece of dust on this portion of the CD, um, it is going to be relatively insignificant. It is not going to have any serious effect or cause any serious interference to this beam which is many orders of magnitude bigger, all right? So, um, and since this, this side here uh, of the CD, okay, where this plastic 
it exists represents really the closest distance that dust can get to the information layer. Okay, we see the, the importance of, of having that, okay, that 1.2 millimeter thick piece of plastic okay, to prevent dust from getting at the information layer. That is why we uh, you know, don't have the laser beam interact directly with the information layer. So it would take you know, millimeter sized pieces of dust on this portion of the CD to actually cause you problems. So you see here how uh, this is purposefully built into the design of a CD, right? We can have dust on this surface on the micrometer size will not cause us any problems because the um, micrometer size pits at the information layer would require our laser beam to be micrometer sized when it reads the pits. Okay, and by the way, I didn't say this, but your, your CD, which starts out as a flat piece of plastic and has these, these pits edged into them, gives us a binary reading, right? I mean, um, either is, a pit is interpreted as either a zero or a one. So as a laser beam moves along a groove, it's reading, you know, uh, these pits and where there's a smooth portion, it interprets, let's say a zero, where there's a pit, it interprets a one. And there is this alternating pattern of, you know, flat portion pit, flat portion pit, this binary code, which is basically converted into uh, that electrical signal to pr produce the sound that you ultimately hear. So we'll now take a look at an effect or phenomenon of refraction known as total internal reflection. If this sounds a little confusing, Okay, we will explain why we've got the word reflection in a phenomenon dealing with refraction. Okay, you will soon see. So what is total internal reflection, sometimes written TIR for short? It's a phenomenon where light striking the boundary between two media is 100% reflected from the boundary. So, <clears throat> Let's take a look at how this can happen, okay, qualitatively at first here. If we have a, an incident wave traveling from a medium with a low wave speed into a medium with a higher wave speed, in other words, into a medium where the wave speeds up, okay, then we know that the refracted wave bends away from the normal to the interface. All right, anytime we have a wave going from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium described by a lower index of refraction, okay, then we know that the refracted ray gets bent away from the normal, as I'm showing you here with the red rays. What would happen, okay, for some incident angle greater than this, we'll say with this yellow ray here, for some incident angle, that refracted ray would be bent so much that it would lie exactly along the interface. In other words, the angle of refraction would be 90 degrees. So we will see later on in this slide that this, is, this sets a, a boundary between reflat, refraction and reflection back into the incident medium. So for this particular angle of incidence, this is what we call the critical angle. The angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So you can imagine that for any light ray, okay, traveling um, from the blue medium into the green medium here, that has an incident angle greater than, okay, the angle I'm showing here, what we call the critical angle, okay, for any angle of incidence greater than this special case, okay, for the yellow ray, now we would expect that the refraction would be so extreme that the refracted ray would actually lie in the initial or incident medium. And while it really is a phenomenon of refraction that is causing this, 
okay, it looks like that ray is being reflected at the boundary. So this is why we call it total internal reflection. So um, to describe this here, okay, we would say, well, first of all, is it reflection or refraction? Realize that TIR is a phenomenon of refraction. Okay, although it looks like reflection, it is really a phenomenon of refraction. Let's think of it as refraction in the extreme. Uh, what are the conditions that lead to TIR? We, we kind of mentioned it here, but there's really two. First of all, the light ray must travel from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium. Okay, it must travel into a medium with a lower index of refraction so that it speeds up, because as we see, that refracted ray has to bend away from the normal. It, the total internal reflection could not happen if the reverse were true, if that ray bent towards the normal. And secondly, okay, we would say that TIR happens when that incident angle, that angle of incidence is greater than some critical angle. Okay, and the critical angle I'm showing you here in this diagram, okay, uh, is the angle made for this yellow incident ray where the refracted ray lies right along okay, the boundary, right along the interface. So here's the two conditions in which TIR occur. And uh, we can write a quantitative expression for the critical angle using Snell's law. Okay, once again, we define the critical angle to be the angle of incidence where the refracted ray lies along the boundary to the interface such that the angle of refraction here would be 90 degrees. And when we incorporate that into Snell's law, we can get an expression for the critical angle. So here's our generic expression for Snell's law. Okay, for uh, theta one or the angle of incidence, we'll put in theta sub c, the symbol we use for the critical angle. And for theta two, we said that we have the special angle of refraction of 90 degrees, in which case when we solve this for theta sub c, okay, we get that uh, theta sub c is the inverse sine of this ratio of n2 to n1. Okay, the refractive index in the transmitted medium, okay, to the refractive index in the incident medium. All right, so in this slide, we will apply the expression we derive for the critical angle to determine some critical angles for some common interfaces, that is some common uh, boundaries bet between two media. So uh, we will use Snell's law in conjunction with uh, a table for refractive indices here. And let's start by asking the question, what is the critical angle for water and air? Now remember that total internal reflection is only going to happen in this case for an incident ray that starts out in water and travels into air, right? Um, only from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium. And optical density is measured by the index of refraction. So here, when we use our expression for the critical angle, remember that um, while this, this expression is easy, you got to make sure that you get the right value for N2 and N1. Okay, so N2, that is the index of refraction for the transmitted medium, which must be air, okay, for TAR to happen, 1.0003 divided by N1, which is the index of refraction of water. So we see here 48.8, about 49 degrees, is the critical angle for water and air. Um, if we look at glass and air, going through the same calculation here, uh, once again, the light ray must be traveling from glass into air. So we've got the index of refraction for air for glass. There's many different types of glass, but if you're looking at light traveling through a typical window, crown glass would be the, the uh, Okay, more likely candidate for the window, has an index refraction of 1.52. Notice that we get a critical angle of about 41.2 degrees. And finally, we'll take a look at diamond air. And you'll see here that because diamond has this very large index of refraction here, 
When you have a light ray that is traveling from diamond into air, it gives you a very small critical angle. And this is very important when we, as we'll see in our last topic today, we'll talk about dispersion, a phenomenon of refraction as well, and see why people are willing to pay so much money for diamonds. All right, so in the next slide, let's take a look at a demo to see okay, total internal reflection happen in real time. All right, folks, I am sitting here in front of this fish tank full of water and a little coffee creamer in it, holding my laser, hoping to demonstrate this phenomenon known as total internal reflection, or just TIR for short. So what is this phenomenon? Okay, well, it's a bit of a misnomer because we call it total internal reflection, but what it really is is an extreme case of refraction. Think of it as refraction in the extreme. When a source of light travels from a more optically dense medium into a less optically dense medium, we get light to bend away from the normal. It refracts away from the normal. And this is due to the fact that light speeds up when it enters the new medium. In this case here, I've got a laser, and we'll turn off our, our light source here. We have a uh, laser beam which is traveling from water and up here it's hitting air okay and when it hits the air it travels through the air now in this case here there is no refraction because the laser light is traveling in a direction perpendicular to the interface in which case the angle of incidence is zero degrees okay but as that laser beam starts to come in at an angle with respect to the interface okay then we see that the light is going to bend away from the normal, as we've already talked about. Now, you probably can't see the laser beam in air, but okay, if you take a look at the ceiling, you'll see that the light is indeed coming out of the water surface and is shining there on the ceiling. Okay, it turns out that as we let that angle of incidence get bigger and bigger and bigger, okay, then the bending, the, the, the uh, refractive beam bends away from the normal okay and it turns out that for some angle of incidence we can get the refraction to be so extreme that as we get so much bending that the refracted ray actually bends right back into the initial medium okay the extra the refraction is so extreme it looks like it's being reflected and that's what you're seeing here. This is a phenomenon of total internal reflection. Really just an extreme case of refraction. And when you look at the ceiling now, you'll see that there is no more light beam coming out. Okay, that the beam that enters the water and hits that water air interface, that energy is getting completely reflected back into the initial medium, which is the water. TIR, folks. So an interesting, practical, and very useful application of uh, total internal reflection in modern society is okay, to the technology known as fiber optics. So a fiber optic, used to be called a light pipe, is a long, thin fiber, usually made of glass or plastic, with an outer coating that must have a lower index of refraction than the fiber core. And we will see in a later slide how this leads to okay, total internal reflection. Um, I'll show you some examples of fiber optics here in this little slide, the simulation here. Um, and fiber optics, if you, if you look at the last, in the last 25 years, telecommunications have been replacing copper wire with fiber optic cables. And you can see why, really two reasons. One, you can send, as Ms. Prig is saying here, more than 25,000 conversations simultaneously through a fiber optic that is no thicker than a human hair. So it becomes, uh, you know, in our modern society and our desire to miniaturize everything, uh, it becomes a, 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 an effective form of communication. The other big advantage of this is that not only does it reduce the amount of space required to transmit signals okay, over long distances, 
but it increases increases the energy efficiency as well. Okay, so you can send signals through fiber optic cables with virtually no loss of energy. So while you're looking at some examples of fiber optic cables, looking at them really tells you nothing about how they work. Um, but if you think about it, if 25,000 conversations can fit into the diameter of a human hair, looking at a single fiber optic in action won't prove very useful. It's just too damn small. Okay, so in the next slide, we're going to take a look at a, a demonstration fiber optic. I'll say a fiber optic on steroids, one that is actually large enough to see. All right, so folks, what you see in front of you is a very large demo fiber optic. And you recall, as we were saying, fiber optics make use of the principle of total internal reflection. Okay, this idea that if you send light through a medium of high optical density that is surrounded by a medium of lower optical density, in other words, such that the light speeds up as it enters the new medium, that for certain angles of incidence, you can get the refracted ray to be so bent, so refracted, that it actually will appear to be reflected back into the incident medium. And so since the incident medium here is this plastic fiber optic, what that means is that we can get a series of reflections down this fiber optic cable with virtually no transmission of light out the other side. So what you're going to see here is I'm going to take this laser and when I put this laser light in one side of the fiber optic, okay, rather than traveling in a straight line, you're going to see this laser light follow the path of the fiber optic cable. Okay, and you will see it coming out of the other side. Why? Because we have this series of total internal reflections taking place. Okay, this extreme refraction that uh, allows the laser light to travel through the fiber optic. All right, so let's see what is going on in the fiber optic and how total internal reflection comes into play. So here is the large demo fiber optic I showed you in the, in the previous slide. And it was made of some sort of plastic. Uh, and so here you see that the criteria for total internal reflection would be that the light has to travel from a more optically dense medium into a less optically dense medium. So since this fiber optic, this piece of plastic is surrounded by air, okay, that criterion is met. And if we shine an incident ray here at one end of the fiber optic, if that ray should strike the side, okay, because of the small critical angle here, as long as the angle of incidence here is greater than the critical angle for these two media, we will get total internal reflection occur um, at this interface. And so then the ray gets reflected, eventually reaches another uh, interface, okay, boundary between the plastic and the air. And if that condition is met, if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, it will experience another total internal reflection. So really what ha happens here is that you have a series of total internal reflections taking place in this fiber optic that will transport the energy okay, from one side of it to the other. So um, this, this was a demo fiber optic. Uh, if you look at a fiber optic that is used in telecommunications technology, it will, well, like the one I showed you, it will be made of uh, of, of glass typically, okay, um, perhaps plastic, but rather than being surrounded by air, it will be surrounded by this protective cladding here, but one that has a low index of refraction, okay, so that the criterion is still met. And you'll see, you see here in this simulation that for all those incident rays, okay, they all meet this criteria of having the incident angle greater than the critical angle, in which case, Okay, the refracted ray is totally internally reflected, in which case not only do these rays travel down the medium from one side to the other, okay, but there is virtually no energy loss. There is no energy escaping the medium. 
So it becomes a very efficient means of transporting energy. Um, here's another simulation. I'll show you this demo, which is pretty cool. You can see that for this laser light, okay, it is also meeting this criteria of total internal reflection. And you can see that, okay, that laser's energy is not leaving, okay, the, the medium, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, one, one more kind of interesting application here that is not much different from the light pipe I showed you in the, in the video clip on the previous slide is the case of a light pipe which is used in medical diagnostics. So imagine that you've got a problem in your stomach and the doctor needs to look at your stomach. Well, how do you, how do you get light down into your stomach so the doctor can see what's going on? Well, these light pipes Think about the large demo fiber optic. The advantage is that that thing can be twisted and turned. And you can see here in the diagram that it's clearly not a straight path from your mouth to your stomach. So you need to put some sort of flexible uh, light pipe down there. And using um, fiber optics, okay, is a, a, pretty much the light pipe like I showed you in the previous slide. Maybe one's a little more flexible. That would probably hurt quite a bit going in your stomach, but um, you can you can bend it around your you know through through your esophagus into your stomach, and you know not only can you shine light from one end to the other, but you could put a camera down there and communicate what is going on inside of your stomach to the doctor on the other end. So, is for all total internal reflection, the criteria must be met that the light travels from a medium with a larger refractive index to one with a smaller refractive index, okay? And the greater the difference between these indices of refraction, the smaller the critical angle will be, which ensures that more total internal reflection will take place, okay, for the fiber optic. In the next slide, we'll see what happens when this criterion, okay, fails to be met. All right, so you see how the light will travel all the way down this fiber optic, even when it's bent and twisted, okay, with virtually no loss of energy, okay, because of total internal reflection. What I want to show you now, however, is what would happen if I were to take this plastic fiber optic and stick it in some corn oil, some vegetable oil that has a very similar index of refraction to plastic. In other words, light travels at a very similar speed in plastic as it does in corn oil. Okay, watch what happens when we do that. Okay, so I'm going to stick the bottom of this in the, in the corn oil here. And watch what happens, okay, when we uh, stick this in. Okay, you will notice that up until it enters the corn oil, the light will travel down, but you'll notice that there is no light traveling out the other side. Why is that? Well, it's because in order for total internal reflection to happen, okay, that light that is incident on the boundary between the plastic and the outer surface, either air or coin oil, okay, that that angle of incidence must be greater than some critical angle. But it turns out in this case that because light travels at virtually the same speed in plastic as it does in corn oil, the total internal reflection uh, is not possible, okay? That the critical angle becomes so large that these rays, when they hit that surface, that boundary between plastic and oil, are now leaving. They're getting transmitted rather than reflected. So once again, this nicely illustrates, okay, under what conditions you actually get total internal reflection, okay? So you must have two media okay, that have uh, optical densities that are different enough so that light will get totally internal reflected, okay, for very uh, small angles of incidence, okay, which is certainly not the case here. So in this next slide, we'll see how you can actually make a fiber optic out of a stream of falling water. So this is what I call soda bottle optics, or okay, as you see here in this simulation, you can, you can do this with a laser and a two liter soda bottle, okay, letting that, that 
uh, water stream fall into a bucket or on the floor if you want. Um, and you'll see that, interestingly enough, it behaves as a fiber optic cable. Okay, you will get the laser light to actually take the path of the water stream. So let's check it out. All right, folks, what we are going to demonstrate here is the classic Tyndall's experiment. This is a great way to see total internal reflection in action. Remember that we were saying that to get total internal reflection, you have to have light travel from a more optically dense medium into a less optically dense medium. That is into a medium where it speeds up. And when that is the case, it is possible that for angles of incidence greater than some critical angle, the light will get refracted to such an extreme amount that it is going to appear to be reflected back. And we said that one of the important applications of this is, the, is fiber optics, where you can actually get light, and I should say light signals, to get transmitted down some sort of material medium, we said usually a piece of plastic, with basically no energy loss. Why? Because of the repeated total internal reflections at the surface between the fiber optic cable and the boundary, let's say the air. Now, in this case here, we are going to look at another example of a fiber optic. We're going to take a look at how water itself, a stream of water, can actually behave as a fiber optic, in which case we can have total internal reflection take place down that stream of water. And so what you see here, what we have in our setup is we have a tank of water, and I'm going to turn it on in a second. We'll see a stream of water come out. And we have a laser which is aimed right through the stream. Of course, you can't see it yet, but once I turn that water on, you will see that that laser light, okay, is going to follow the stream of water, okay? It's going to follow the path that the water takes. So let me turn this on and let's see how this works, okay? And we get our lights here, okay? And you can see very nicely, that you know that laser light travels in a straight line, yet because of total internal reflection, okay, that light is actually following the curved path of the water in the same way light follows a fiber optic cable. Very cool, huh? Another interesting application of total internal reflection is the formation of mirages. So as you can see here in these simulations, and we'll take a look at the one on the right, the ground heats up, making air in contact with it much hotter than the air that's higher up. This causes the air in contact with the ground to have a lower density than the air higher up. Okay, whereas normally denser air sinks, the high temperature on the ground causes okay, this inversion layer where the air density actually increases higher up. Um, light reflected from the sky, as you can see here, gets refracted away from the normal as it travels downward towards the ground. So this illustration kind of nicely shows this. And if you take a look here, um, you, can, you can see these density planes, these these layers of air of different densities, okay, increasing air densities you go up. And uh, basically that provides the condition, con one of the preconditions for total internal reflection, right? So we get air traveling from a higher density to a lower density so that it gets refracted away from the normal. So as, it, as the light travels downwards towards the ground, light from the sun that is, the refraction is so great near the ground that total internal reflection occurs. And here's the thing, since our eye sees light in, in straight lines, this refracted light, okay, remember our brain is not smart enough to interpret that, so when that light hits your eye, it would see it um, coming in a straight line uh, 
you know, we see it straight ahead on the ground. And this reflected light, which is really skylight, looks, okay, to the naked eye like water. Okay, so it turns out that skylight has the same look. Um, when we actually see the image formed on the ground, it looks like water. Okay, so um, throughout history, mirages occurring in the desert landscapes, and now we'll revert to the picture on the left, looks like this camel is experiencing a little bit of a mirage here. Um, so uh, <clears throat> mirages occurring in desert landscapes have led to sightings of all sorts of things. You know, most commonly water and oases, sometimes including palm trees in the middle of the desert. But in modern times, light is behaving quite differently than it ever did in the past, okay, leading to some refraction effects that cannot be easily explained by the ray model of light. So let's take a look at the modern day mirage. See if you can explain that. In the last effective refraction that we'll take a look at today, one that I've alluded to many times throughout this pre presentation, is what we call dispersion. So dispersion is the property that light of different colors and thus different wavelengths is refracted by different amounts when entering a new medium. So we know that light gets refracted, but it turns out that different colors of light get refracted by different amounts. So you can see that nicely illustrated in this simulation here of the prism, right? That white light actually enters the prism here, okay? But upon uh, really entering, traveling from air into the prism material, okay? Some transparent medium like glass or plastic, you'll see that the different colors of the uh, of light okay are refracted by different amounts so um, to, let's try to explain this try to explain the refraction remember we said in a previous slide that there is this inverse relationship between the index of refraction and the wavelength so as we say here the definition of the index of refraction right c over v okay c the speed of light in vacuum v the speed of light in the material Okay, and according to the wave equation, V equals lambda F. Since F is a constant and C is a constant, you can clearly see here that there's this inverse relationship between the index of refraction and the wavelength of light that enters it. Here's the uh, relationship that we derived on a previous slide, and this tells us too, okay, this inverse relationship. You see here lambda 2 equals 1 over N2. Okay, inverse relationship between okay, lambda and the index of refraction. So considering this, um, let's take a look at the relationship between the color of light and the refraction, the amount of bending. Which end of the electromagnetic spectrum would you uh, would have the largest index of refraction? Okay, the red end or the blue end? Well, okay, using what we know about our the chronology of the electromagnetic spectrum and the definition of the index of refraction, the largest n value would correspond to the smallest wavelength. Okay, thus blue light, okay, or violet light, really at one end of the electromagnetic spectrum has the smallest wavelength. Okay, would have the largest value of n. So, okay, in answering this next question, considering a beam of white light traveling from air into a transparent medium, okay, um, uh, which color of light should get slowed down more as it enters the new medium? Well, okay, given what we just said, since blue light has a larger index of refraction than red light, okay, that means that blue light should get slowed down more, should have the smaller speed in the new medium, okay, than does red light. And if I then ask which color of light would you expect to get to get bent or refracted more and traveling from air into the transparent medium, the red or the blue. Okay, we would expect that since the blue light gets slowed down more, it also will get refracted more than the red light. And so you see here in the simulation that the white light that enters it 
you'll see that the violet or blue light gets bent much more than the red light. As I prefaced in the previous slide, one of the common applications of dispersion is to that of prisms, where we see that the white light that enters one side of the prism is refracted or separated into okay, its various uh, okay, spectral colors in the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, this illustration here shows what we looked at on the last slide, but you'll see the white light that enters. You'll see that there's really two refractions that happen, right? So that white light uh, gets refracted at this first interface over here, okay, separating the white light into its very spectrum of colors. Um, you'll see here that the red light gets refracted by a lesser amount than the violet light down here on the bottom, right? Because the index of refraction for red light is uh, <clears throat> smaller than that for blue light or violet light. Um, but also notice here at the second interface as the light leaves the prism that it gets refracted a second time here. And that causes further separation of the colors. Um, so one of the ways and, and some of the problems you get dealing with prisms are really problems of geometry. And we call this angle of deviation here. That is the uh, angle of refraction here that one of the colors, and here they're showing you the angle of deviation for the red light, okay, makes with respect to not the normal to the interface, Okay, but that is the angle that the refracted ray makes with respect to the incident ray. So that's really showing you a direct measure of how much okay, deviation there is okay, or bending there is due to refraction. Another interesting application of dispersion is the formation of rainbows where water droplets behave as tiny little prisms to disperse light. So let's take a look and see if we can explain the rainbow formation. What I'm showing you here are two rather large water droplets. The one on the bottom would be a water droplet that's lower in the sky. Okay, the one on top, a water droplet that's higher in the sky. And you see here that Okay, when we have light that enters these droplets from the sun, and that's what I'm showing you here, so at a certain angle, the sunlight would enter these droplets. And you'll see here that as the light travels through the water droplet, okay, it gets bent towards the normal, okay, with the initial reflection. You see here that the white light from the sun gets separated into its colors. I'm showing you the red and the purple here at opposite ends of the spectrum. You see here that the red light gets refracted by a lesser amount than the purple light. Um, you'll notice though there's also uh, when the light hits the back of the droplet, it gets totally internally reflected. Okay, and um, then it exits out the other side of the droplet. So you'll see here that um, for water droplets high up in the sky, okay, the refraction, the extreme refraction of that violet light means that when you're standing on the ground, that light will miss your eye. Only the red light okay, is going to be able to hit your eye. And I've given you some angles here that are described. So um, only for really that, that red light leaves the water droplet at a 42 degree angle of deviation from its angle of from its initial direction and those droplets can be seen by you on the ground um, for the water droplets that are lower in the atmosphere um, you'll see the same phenomenon of happens here that the light gets dispersed okay upon entering the water droplet so that we get the separation of colors um, but for here for those lower droplets uh, there, the blue light will get, or the violet light will get refracted into your eye, whereas the red light will hit the ground. So you can kind of see here, if I were to ask you the question, what color will you always see at the top of the rainbow, and assuming you're standing on the ground, of course, 
Okay, well, you would expect to see the red light at the top of the rainbow, whereas you would expect to see the violet light at the bottom of the rainbow. So red on top, violet on the bottom, okay, due to the refraction that happens and the separation of colors, which we call dispersion. Right, and the last application of dispersion that I've alluded to a couple times today is okay, the brilliance that uh, is displayed by diamonds. So what is the physics behind the brilliance of a diamond? Okay, well, let me show you here. When we talk about brilliance, we're really talking about the fact that many colors of light appear reflected off the diamond. And so, you know, the, the more uh, ref refraction of those colors of light that enter your eye, Okay, the more expensive the diamond, and the cut of the diamond has everything to do with, okay, its brilliance. Um, how much, to, you know, to what degree you're going to get the separation of colors when the diamond is when what is exposed to white light. So let's see if we can take a look, and these these simulations kind of nicely illustrate what's going on. Um, there's really two effects going on here. First of all. As I said previously, because diamond has such a high index of refraction, this means that the critical angle for the diamond air interface is quite small, which means that total internal reflection will occur for many angles of incidence. So that's the first effect. The second effect is that, you know, since this refracted ray will stay within the diamond for many different uh, you know, trips across the diamond for many different refractions because of that small critical angle, it has lots of time for dispersion to occur. Okay, with each reflection, each total internal reflection from one of the faces, um, this allows more dispersion to happen, more separation of the colors. And separating the many colors of white light into uh, its brilliant spectrum of colors is Okay, what makes diamonds expensive and what you pay for. So um, the, the, the cut of the diamond, and we won't get into that here, but the, the geometry of the cut can uh, add to this effect, right? Add to the total number of, you know, total internal reflections that happen in the diamond and further increase its brilliance, further increase the amount of dispersion taking place.